I'm a teacher, so as a teacher, I'm going to do what I do best. I'm going to give you guys a test. I'm going to give you a basic IQ test. Now, remember the rules of an IQ test. You're not to ask help from anybody else. The purpose is to see what you're capable of doing on your own. Okay? So I'm going to put up the first question. For the sake of time, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to answer it. Just about 10 more seconds. Okay, come up with an answer. All right, time's up. Correct answer here is B, four. Now, if you got it right, good for you. If not, listen carefully. I'm going to walk you through exactly how to get this question correct. Now, this is a pattern recognition question. In this case, the pattern is in the rows, not in the columns. The pattern here is that the sum of the first two columns is equal to the product of the last two columns. So if you follow this pattern all the way down to the last row, the sum of the first two columns is 16, meaning the product of the last two must also be 16, leaving you with a product or a factor of 4. Okay? All right, so good for you uh, for this first question. Now, this, this is a little bit of a unique IQ test. We'll call this a choose-your-own-adventure IQ test. I'm going to give you an option for your second question. You can choose for the second question to be very similar to this one, or you can choose for it to be something completely different. Okay, so in your head, I'd like you to make a decision which of the two you'd prefer to have for your second question. Okay, you guys ready? All right, here's question number two. <laughs> what if I told you, just based on how you did on the first question and the decision you made about the second, I can tell you the level at which you allow fear to run your everyday decisions. Fear is an amazing animal instinct. It's what has allowed the human species to survive for a very, very long time. It's what keeps us from touching our fingers to a hot stove or uh, trying to cross a busy intersection. It's what keeps us from swimming with sharks or jumping out of airplanes. Most of us, at least. But when you get past the idea of fear for survival and you start considering the fear of failure, it's amazing just how much you can allow fear to manipulate every aspect of your life. Let's refer back to this question. Let's say you got the first question right. Good for you. But then you made a choice for the second question to be very similar to the first. This is the perfect example of someone who's in a high fear quotient, or high FQ. Someone in a high FQ believes strongly in the idea of perfection. You feel like you need to be perfect in just about everything that you do, whether it's the first time or the 50th time. So understandably, the first time you try something new, it brings with it a great deal of pressure to perform. Someone with a high FQ puts a whole lot of energy behind protecting two key perceptions. The first one is how they perceive themselves, and the second is how others perceive them. So these people care a great deal about societal labels, being called smart, funny, uh, attractive, creative, successful. All of these things support their perception. So they avoid uh, challenge at all cons. Because with challenge comes risk. With risk comes risk of failure. And if you have a high fear quotient, failure is the scariest word in the English language. So if you got the first question right, good for you. You made a decision that if you could choose, you just want more of the same. You want to do what you know you can do well so that you can continue to keep that high perception. Or inversely, if you got the first question wrong, it didn't matter that I walked you through exactly how to get the question correct because the idea of imperfection has started to make its way into your conscious thought. And if you have a choice, you're going to run as far away from that idea as possible. Now, inversely, if you have a low fear quotient, you don't care about perfection. Perfection doesn't exist. Societal labels, you think they're all relative. There's always someone smarter. There's always someone funnier. There's always someone more successful. So you don't go after. You don't seek out labels. What you seek out is growth. You seek out areas of your own limitations and how you can overcome those limitations. So if you got the first question right, you already know you're capable of doing this kind of question. You don't want more of the same. You want a challenge. You seek out a challenge because failure is what you're searching for. It's where you can identify what your limitations are and so you can push your energy into how to overcome them. Or subsequently, if you got the first question wrong, you listen meticulously to my explanation of exactly how to get this question correct. 
And if I gave you the choice, you want to tackle that exact same limitation again to see if it's been overcome. As you can imagine, a low fear quotient is ideal in many situations, but it's quickly becoming the minority in our classrooms. You know, I can think back when I was in middle school and high school and I did my own research projects, my teachers required multiple sources, just like we do today. But those sources were books. There were magazines, there were journals, there were encyclopedia. They weren't online, they weren't internet, because websites didn't exist back then. I might be aging myself, but they didn't. So I had to work very hard to build up my research and build credible research. And I typically had to spend multiple days trying to find exactly what I needed for that particular paper. But our generation today can get all of the research that I accumulated in those few days as hard as I worked with the wiggle of their thumb. Our kids are growing up in a society of instant gratification. And I'm not just talking about the internet. It seems like the most popular parenting styles are encouraging the exact same thing. The idea of everybody wins. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a ribbon. Everybody gets ice cream at the end of the game. And I get it. I'm a father. I have a little one at home. When he's sad, I'm sad. So I completely understand why your immediate instinct would just be to want to cuddle them and hug them and make them smile immediately so that they don't have to worry about any sort of pain. But what that's doing is causing two very serious problems for our kids. The first is we're completely devaluing effort. By telling kids that regardless of the effort you put into a task, everyone receives the same reward, is basically making them understand that they don't need to work as hard to get the same sort of rewards and values that they're seeking out. And the second and most, most important problem, in my opinion, is that we're eliminating the opportunity for them to experience failure because we're quick to deflect failure for them. We're quick to say it's somebody else's fault, it's not important, distract, let's distract you with something else. We're quick to get them away from the idea of developing their own sort of ways to, uh, to deal with failure and learn to fail forward which means you understand exactly what the challenge ahead of you was, and instead of stopping immediately with the first obstacle, you learn how to overcome it. You know, I can think of a very, you know, very key problems here, because basically what this causes is the students that walk into our classrooms to come with an amazing sense of entitlement. They walk into our classrooms simply expecting results, but they're not willing to stick their necks out to get them. I can think of one student that I've taught in the past in particular. His name's Wes. That's his real name. I'd be happy to give you his contact information so you can annoy him as much as he annoyed me. <laughs> but I will. Talk to me later. But the thing with Wes, it, my, my annoyance with him had nothing to do with me disliking him. In fact, he's one of my all-time favorite students, and we still keep in contact today. What annoyed me to no end about Wes was how much potential I knew he had how capable I knew he was and how successful I knew he would be if he could just put some effort into the task and if I could just get him to try and really do what he needed to to succeed. Every day I told him this and every day I pushed it as much as I possibly could and I never got that level of effort from him. And what's sad is I can think of 20, 25 kids that I'm teaching right now that are just like Wes. And it's easy to label these kids. It's easy to just call them lazy and say that they lack focus. That's completely untrue. These are the same kinds of kids that can go on a 12-hour heater playing the same video game with the kind of focus of an astronaut docking with a space station. <laughs> They'll forget to eat because they're so focused. So don't tell me these kids can't focus. They just won't. I've come to realize that these kids have a very high fear quotient. They've gone through life with minimal obstacles, either because they've just been naturally perfect at absolutely everything they've ever done, or more likely, any time failure was about to approach them, those around them who loved them very much quickly deflected that failure so they never even knew it existed. So they're walking into our classrooms, very likely experiencing failure for the very first time. And we as educators are not going to deflect that failure for them. So they've come up with an amazing strategy for this. To avoid failure, they've learned to accept it. Here's what I mean by this. They'll purposely avoid from putting the necessary effort to succeed in a task so that when they fail, they can blame it on the fact that they didn't put 100% of the effort in necessary to succeed. So now we as teachers call them smart but lazy. Parents call them smart but lazy. They have so much potential. And that's exactly what they want. They win. They got their smart label. 
They got their protection of their perception, and they're ready to move on. We gave them their ice cream. And I realized that all I did with Wes for that entire year was just feed him his ice cream. It's no surprise I can never get him to change. You know, I know this seems hopeless, but there's good news. A high FQ is a learned behavior. And just like any learned behavior, it can be corrected. So to talk about how, I'd like to show you a video. This is me. I won't say much else about it. I'll just play it. OK, stop right there. All right, let me start by saying this does not end well. <laughs> just prepare yourselves now. I know this is hard to believe, but I, I'm sure you could tell from my less than perfect form here. I have absolutely no gymnastics experience whatsoever. Absolutely not. So what could possibly convince me to try to do something like this, knowing very well that I had an extremely high chance of failure? Let's watch it again, this time all the way through. There's a foam pit. I knew that even though I was likely to fail on this task, the long-term risk of damage was relatively low. So I was willing to try this. Now think about it. If someone were to ask me, do you think I'd do this kind of jump on solid ground? Of course not. Absolutely not. And then if they overheard the conversation and heard me say that I wouldn't do this jump, do you think they'd call me lazy? Then why do we do it to our kids? Why do we set up these high-risk situations for kids that have no experience with failure and then we act surprised when they're not willing to take it on. We need to develop a foam pit for these kids to slowly start to develop an understanding and a confidence in the idea of failure. We have to teach them how to slowly develop these foam pits for themselves so they can take these kinds of risks. I mean, think about it. Why do they have these kinds of foam pits in the facilities in the first place, in these gymnastics facilities? They're not there for any sort of event. There's no Olympic foam pit event, right? <laughs> if there was, I'd watch more Olympics, but there aren't. They're there to give kids the chance to try something new and be slowly coached and critiqued so they can learn what they're doing little by little until they build the confidence to try this on solid ground. There are many ways we can do this as educators to try to establish an environment that's conducive to risk taking and that encourages a scenario and an idea where you can, you can stumble and recover every single day before the big high risk assessment comes up. But outside of this classroom, this can happen the exact same way. We have to develop ways to slowly build our kids into the risk scenario that they're so terrified for. Besides that, there are two other things that I think we need to start doing. Secondly, we really need to start valuing effort. If your kid comes home having an A from a class that they had no problem with, and then working very, very hard on a B for another, celebrate the B. Congratulate the B. You'd be amazed at the message that sends to your kids. And finally, we have to stop deflecting effort. Or sorry, we have to stop deflecting failure from all of our kids and from ourselves. We have to start teaching everyone to confront failure and start asking very specific questions. Questions like, what role did I have in this particular failure? What can I have control over in this particular event? What could I have done differently to avoid this situation from occurring? What can I learn from this? And what can I do to make myself better? I'd like to end with this quote. If we can teach ourselves to trust in our ability to overcome obstacles, we can get our own ice cream. Thank you very much.